Welcome to the Snowball Group. Welcome to the Snowball Group. Why are you interested in this website? Maybe you heard about it from someone else. Um, maybe you are interested in a very specific thing that you know is part of the offerings that are on this website. Um, if I were to say one thing that's really the guiding thing behind what I've created here, it's the principle of time management. Um, I'll come back to what I mean exactly by that after I say a little bit more about the whole issue of a snowball. So the idea with the snowball is small, relatively small actions can produce new results and a series of actions um, in the same area of your life can produce um, really dramatic results, even in pretty short periods of time. A sh series of even small changes in several different areas of your life or several different areas of your business can produce massive improvements. Sometimes with pretty little um, investment or change or uh, friction, sometimes really smooth, a series of really small changes across a couple different areas sometimes can produce really dramatic results and quickly. So time management I mentioned. So time management, how is it that time and management informs all of the different um, interests that I have here. Well, first of all, self-interest. I got to know what my self-interests are. My self-interests include things like promoting my health, promoting my financial well-being, um, marketing a business is, of course, related to financial well-being, and to have great communication skills and to have good time management. That's all stuff that promotes my self-interest. I want to know what my self-interests are, and I want to promote them well. And so with time management, I want to have clarity to sort out what do I need to stop doing or do less of, and what do I need to do more of or start doing. Um, and how do I tell? What's the, what's the exercise that I can use to assess what's really my priority? currently. What really creates emotional power in my experience? Where's my focus really drawn to? And then how do I assess which actions are um, in alignment with my interests and which ones um, might be in alignment, but I don't know yet. Let's try it, or you know, let's consider that. Let's test it, and then what it, what actions clearly are not in conformity with um, a really primary interest that I might take on as a focus for a period of time. Um, why a group? Well. When I'm operating just by myself, I'm limited to my own expertise and my own um, intelligence. When I am interacting with a group of people, then I've got different perspectives of other people that can contribute to me, different uh, realms of expertise that can contribute to me. Um, people may have questions for me that I've never thought of that are really beneficial questions for me. So, you know, why a group? Well, um, the short version is because with groups of people, it's possible to have so much better results in short periods of time with short, amount of, short amounts of resources. The time management value of high quality groups is massive. But there is that issue of the quality of the group, the quality of the communication, the quality of the relationships. So what would be a high quality group? Well, it's, it's a group that promotes people's clarity about self-interest, 
and uh, what actions fit it, fit the self-interest. That's basically it. Um, of course, expertise can be also a very valuable element of that if there's specific expertise in a certain area. So uh, the basic idea is that we want to find things that are great for time management, for producing the results that we value, and then also find things that aren't so good. And one of the things I'll, I just thought to mention in passing, if we're condemning other people's methods, even when those people aren't present, that's a possible major drain on time. We may even go out of our way to spend time looking for things to condemn, methods, things that practices, actions that people have taken 100 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. Even we can look back in our own life and look for things to condemn. Well, looking for things to condemn is actually a kind of an odd investment of time. What is the benefit of finding some action or some person to condemn? Um, there could be one, but in general, I don't find that especially a, a, appealing. Um, so in a group of people or in a relationship of two people, when there is a really committed interest to identifying self-interests and promoting them, we may find that condemning actions isn't a big investment of time. Maybe that used to be something that people... Uh, we're familiar with, but we just find that it doesn't happen very much. Um, I do want to know why is it that people, I want to bring up the subject of, of why is it that people might have so little clarity about their self-interest? Because self-interest, as far as health and financial well-being and so on, these are things that are pretty much universal. Everybody is interested in these things. Everybody has that self-interest in health and well-being, even in high quality of life, fun, um, good relationships, healthy relationships. Everybody wants these things, generally speaking. Um, so why would it ever be an issue that we would want to find a really high quality group? Well, institutions, as distinct from groups and networks, actual institutions have interests and in promoting the interests of the institution one of the things that can happen is that individuals self-interests can be um, suppressed so there can be a big institution that benefits 1% of the people involved with the institution or 5% or 30% or whatever, some fraction, some portion of the people involved in the institution are going to get above average benefits. That's the nature of institutions mathematically. That's the nature of math. Any group of people, some are going to have above average <laughs> results for that group. Um, so Institutions grow and prosper and thrive by subduing some of the self-interests of some people in order to promote the interests of uh, certain other people, certain other small groups. Um, I'm not making a uh, condemnation of this phenomenon that interests uh, that institutions have uh, produced results that that promote the self-interest of some people more than others that's just a fact um, so I respect that fact I respect that institutions are useful for disproportionately benefiting uh, larger small groups of people in contrast to other people that could be um, participating somehow in the institution. So 
institutions can, can they can program us to think in certain ways, to speak in certain ways, um, to act in certain ways that bring our health results to benefit the institution in some way. In other words, um, some institutions may want us to be um, within a certain range of health. They don't want us to be too um, ailing. They don't want us to be too sick, like vomiting or something, to be unable to contribute to the institution. But they also may not really want us to be so healthy that we outgrow the institution. Uh, same with finances. They don't want us to be necessarily, necessarily destitute. They want us to be able to come and contribute and be part of the, um, the institution's activities. But what if we get independently wealthy? Well, independently wealthy sounds a lot like independence, like not dependent on the institution. Institutions thrive through people being dependent on the institution. So if people are really independent of the institution in regard to wealth or health or um, their capacity to uh, uh, have healthy relationships, then why do they need the institution? The institution has to then really compete with a lot of other institutions. And ideally, an institution is going to thrive by monopolizing by having um, negative consequences for anybody who steps out of the institution. So if you um, think about a social group, a group of people, say a neighborhood, I'll just pick a, a physical neighborhood for simplicity. So in a neighborhood, uh, there are some people who um, maybe they they have a big party frequently, and it's great for them, but it's not good for the for the neighborhood. Well, in the case of of an occasional big party, it, it kind of depends on how big of a deal it is. But the inst the neighborhood, the group of people in the neighborhood are want are going to want to have. Um, some d degree of uh, predictability. So it's fine if maybe it's fine if people go and uh, you know have a party somewhere else, but we don't want it in our neighborhood. It's too loud. It's, there's too much of an issue with parking or whatever it is. So I just thought of that spontaneously. This issue of a, of a party. But um, another thing about a neighborhood is if there are a bunch of homeowners in the neighborhood, they don't want 40% of their neighbors to leave. That's bad for home values. If all sorts of homes right along the same street are all going up for sale and there are, you know, uh, isn't anyone living in them, that's not great for the neighborhood, for the remaining people. So that's probably a better um, example for the neighborhood to thrive. The neighborhood wants to maintain a certain um, uh, occupancy rate. They want to have certain kind of people, certain kind of households um, in terms of their social status or economic status. Um, if you have a uh, some really ugly homes in the neighborhood, then or some really badly kept yards, other people in the neighborhood could get concerned. So. The neighborhood itself is like an institution, and for and it's it's totally makes sense that you could have a homeowners association. They would have certain um, uh, things that they encourage, things that they punish if you don't do. It makes sense. Um, whether we agree with the details of it or not, we can understand why they exist. Um, so in life. If I want to promote my self-interest, 
I could condemn other people's self-interest. I could condemn the institution for pursuing its self-interest. I could condemn this guy or that group for pursuing their self-interest. That is not probably good time management, right? That's not really producing anything of value to me to condemn those other people. For me to look at other people and see what they're doing, uh, maybe I can say, oh, well, that, there sure are getting in a lot of fights. There's a lot of infighting in that homeowners association. There's a lot of um, uh, divisiveness within that household or within that business or um, that department of the business. There, there's a lot of, you know, um, bickering. We can notice those things. We don't have to condemn them. We can just notice them and go, wow, yeah, that's notable. Um, if I'm a manager of an organization and I notice bickering within a particular department, I'm going to think there's, there's a need for some special supervision, some special attention to address whatever the underlying issues are below the bickering or the antagonisms, the divisiveness, the condemnation, and the, you know, the, the invalidating um, patterns of speaking that people can get into. So we, you know, there's that issue of changing the culture of a department or of a business or of a household or of a community, of a group. By culture, I mean the way that they interact with each other, the things that they do, the way that they think, the way that they speak, and of course the results that they get. So the snowball group to bring things back together. The Snowball Group is interested in big scale changes. Lots of little changes, but potentially really big differences in outcomes. And I would say the number one thing is a recognition of the real driving interests that have people do the things they do and get the results they get. And once I know my priority interests, time management becomes possible. And until I'm aware of my own priority interests, how do I manage time relative to what point of reference? So I want high quality of life, fun, health, wealth, um, safety, you know, I could go on with a list of things that uh, eventually would get really long. But the list is almost the same for everybody. And we have this phenomenon that we're exposed to institutions, mainstream media, um, school systems, a variety of churches can fit this category, a variety of institutions that are giving us messages about our self-interest and what we should be interested in how people should be, what people should do, what people should not do, and so on. And those things, um, those messages are coming through an institution because that's what promotes the institution. I can respect that every institution promotes its own, um, generally speaking, every institution promotes its own survival, its own you know, um, continuance, even its own growth and um, dominance. So in a group of people where everyone is respectful of self-interest, where everyone is interested in time management, where everyone is interested in their own health, and their own financial well-being, and their own time management practices, their own communication skills, their own healthy relationships, where everybody comes in with that background of what you might call responsibility, then it's a distinct group. Um, in many cases, I could assess groups that I've been in the past and say, well, yeah, people talked about responsibility, but they didn't really have um, a stake in each other's out outcomes. They weren't really interested in each other's outcomes.
there wasn't really partnership at the level that appeals to me. So I can raise this question of what is a really functional partnership or a really effective partnership? It doesn't mean that my interests are identical to the other people within the partnership. There must be some degree of uh, uh, consistency amongst the interests for there to be a partnership that lasts. But the interests, why, you know, why would they be exactly identical? That's an interesting idea. Generally speaking, people have the same self-interest. So within the other content that, that I'll be making available, I will specify how I think and how my thinking has changed, but especially how I think now about health or uh, what really promotes wealth well. Um, I will make reference to specific actions I've taken or specific actions that other people can take um, and the results that come from those actions. So this whole process is about identifying what right now is the priority interest for you, knowing that over time your interest is going to shift to something else. Once you handle a particular issue, then something else will be the priority. So there's going to be a cycle of uh, priorities. Almost inevitably, people will encounter um, a health challenge or a financial challenge or some kind of challenge that's not what they've been focusing on lately. So over time, new opportunities will arrive, new arise, new challenges will arise, and even small actions can benefit us. So another thing I'll mention in closing, if people say, well, I know what I, my priority is, but I don't know anything that I can do to um, promote that interest currently. I have some condition in my life that, you know, I'm, I'm now up to the point where I can't promote that thing any further than what I'm doing right now. That's, uh, you know, that's what, I've, what, I'm, what I've got. Okay, so move on to that next area of life. If you've done everything that there is for you to do now in regard to your relationship, great. Move on to your uh, health or move on to your finances or whatever it is. Just keep moving through these self-interest, these priorities, these uh, areas of interest to you and keep moving through them with this group. Let's share, have conversations about our, um, our explorations, our successes, even our disappointments and um, frustrations. Uh, what we are afraid of is going to spark us into action as long as we know what attracts us. If we know what attracts us, the more fear, disappointment, and frustration I have behind me, so to speak, as long as I know where I'm going, the more negative emotions I have behind me, the greater my motivation is, the greater my velocity or momentum can be. I propel myself. Once I know my destination, my target, I propel myself with um, attention to what isn't working for me the result that I have that I don't want. So in many cases, people are used to dissatisfaction being something they want to eliminate from their life. That is not actually the goal here. The goal here is to improve your quality of life in all sorts of different areas so that when dissatisfaction arises, it benefits you. You benefit from the arising of dissatisfaction. Now that might be a radical idea to some people, given that a lot of people are trying to avoid dissatisfaction with tremendous amounts of energy. What if you were open to dissatisfaction? I want to know exactly where I'm dissatisfied and where I'm dissatisfied the most and how and when and also when I'm satisfied the most. That's really the same issue as far as 
a glass half empty or a glass half full, it's the same glass. So if I can be flexible in how I relate to that class, how I talk about it, that's just more freedom for me. That's an, an additional resource for me to be able to relate to things in a variety of different ways and look for which one really motivates me now to do the things that I already know I want to do, to produce the outcomes I already know that I want to produce. If I can relate to my outcomes and my current conditions and my experience to motivate me to efficiently move toward my outcomes, wonderful. It's even small steps, even small investments of time or energy can produce Traumatic, tremendous results, dramatic results. Um, momentum can, can, all you have to do to grow momentum is start momentum growing. And in some cases, that snowball just really takes off down the hill. Once you get it going, it can get very large very quickly. Your improvements can be startling, refreshing. Welcome to the Snowball Group.